Hey there, subscribe to my channel, and also press this bell icon so you never miss any new updates cause whenever we upload new video you will get a notification on your phone. We'll hear two university students planning a computer programming lesson. First you have some time to look at questions 1 to 4. Now listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 4. Hi, Hardeep. Is now a good time for us to plan that computer programming lesson we've been assigned? Hey, Don. I was just thinking about that, actually. Yes, let's get it out of the way now, shall we? I've got the instructions here. So, it says, Design a 45-minute lesson for a class of 16 teenagers where they learn how to write a simple computer program in BASIC. Now, I know, of course, that BASIC is the computer language people used to use back in the 1980s when they wrote programs on microcomputers, but I'm not sure I feel very comfortable teaching anyone about it. Well, I did a bit of research yesterday and found out quite a few things, so I think we'll be okay. Great. So, what do you have in mind? Well, I think we should presume that none of the kids will know anything about BASIC. So, why don't we start with a short multiple-choice quiz? It could focus on things like what BASIC is, what the letters stand for, when people used it, things like that. That sounds good. I guess it shouldn't take long. Just the first five minutes of the lesson, something like that. I don't think we should make the students do it on their own, though. That'd make it too much like a test. Shall we let them do it in two so they can discuss their choices? Yes, good idea. Then we'll go through the answers with them as a whole group. Good. What next? Well, I've had an idea for the program they could write. I'll tell you about that in a minute. I think the key thing is, though, that before they actually sit at their computers, and I think we should presume that they're doing this lesson in a computer room, they make a flow chart of what they want the program to do. That's usually the best way to start writing a program. This flow chart will show all the different stages of the computer program, right? Exactly. It's probably best if the teacher stands at the board and everyone works on that together. Yes, otherwise they'll all come up with different flow charts and it'll get confusing. Precisely. I imagine making the flow chart will take about 15 to 20 minutes. Then they use that to write their computer program. Well, actually, I think there's a stage before that. You see, the flow chart will be in English. They're going to need to be taught a few basic commands so they can write their computer program. Hmm. Now I'm getting out of my depth. What kind of thing would that be? Well, for example, when you want text to appear on the screen, the command is PRINT in capital letters, followed by the text you want to appear in double inverted commas. Oh yes, I think I've seen that before. Right, so they'll need to be taught five or six commands before they use them to write their program. Okay, so how shall we do that? With the teacher talking to the whole class again? Well, we could but it might be more fun to make it more like a competition where there are a few teams competing against each other. Each team has maybe four or five people in it and they have to do some kind of matching task. You know, they match the command print with to make text appear on the screen, something like that. That sounds good. Teenagers love competing with each other. Exactly. And then, for the final part of the lesson, they use their flowchart and the commands they've learned to produce the program. Let's presume, shall we, that there are eight computers in the room, so that's two students for each computer. That sounds reasonable. So, tell me more about your idea for the computer program they're going to write. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 5 to 10.
Now listen and answer questions 5 to 10. Okay, so it's a very simple program. I've actually written it down here so we can go through it together. Okay, so the first line says 10 CLS. What on earth does that mean? Well, every line of a basic computer program starts with a number. They usually go up in tens, so the first line is 10, the second 20, and so on. And CLS is the command we use in BASIC to clear the screen. Oh, I see. So that's just telling the computer to start with a blank screen. Exactly. Then we move on to the next line. So this one says, 20, print, guess a number between 1 and 10. Right, I see. That appears on the screen. It's not that difficult, is it, when you get the hang of it? Let's see if I can work out the next one. 30, input I. Oh, not sure about that. Well, all that's saying is that the person playing types in a number. Input is the basic command for type in, and I just means any number you like. Oh, okay. Then what happens next depends on what the number is. So we've got 40 if I is less than 1, or if I is greater than 10. Then print, bad choice. Right, so if they type, say, 0 or 11, that appears on the screen. Exactly. And then this next line takes them back to where it asks them to type in a number between 1 and 10. That's line 50. I see. And line 60 says, if I equals 6, then print. Correct. Ah, okay. So if they've typed 6, they've got it right. And if they haven't typed 6, which is the next line, then try again comes up on the screen, and that takes them back to where they choose another number. It's clever. Well done. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear someone talking about travelling around New Zealand. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now listen and answer questions 11 to 15. When thinking about beautiful countryside or stunning views, it has long been accepted that Australia and New Zealand have few equals. What is perhaps slightly less well known is what these countries can offer to the avid train enthusiast. Both countries have railways which pass through breathtaking scenery in the utmost of comfort. In New Zealand, you can travel from the country's biggest city, Auckland, to where a third of the population lives, its capital, Wellington, on the longest passenger rail service in the country, the Overlander. Crossing 681 kilometres, the train winds through the lush farmland of the Waikato and up the Rarumu Spiral onto an amazing volcanic plateau surrounded by native bush. On a clear day, you will be able to see three of New Zealand's most famous volcanoes, Mount Ruapehu, Mount Narahoe, and Mount Tongariro. The whole journey can be completed in 11 hours, but for those keen to see a little more of the country, the trip can be extended over three or four days. This gives travellers the opportunity of seeing the famous Waitomo Caves, 
relaxing in the mud pools of Rotorua, or skydiving over Lake Taupo. Moving on to the South Island, you can take the Transalpine through the Southern Alps, travelling from the South Pacific Ocean to the Tasman Sea. Climbing from Christchurch right into the Alps, this 223km trip is particularly impressive as the train passes through 16 tunnels before descending to Greymouth at the end of the line. Taking only 5 hours, this is a relatively short trip, but it is worth noting that this journey has been listed as the 6th most scenic rail route in the world. For those that are not so keen on mountains, the South Island has a second option, the Transcoastal. With the sea on one side and the mountains on the other, it again shows some of the best scenery New Zealand has to offer. Also taking 5 hours, one of the highlights of this journey is the opportunities for whale watching. The fortunate few that see whales are well rewarded, but there are more common sights which are just as enjoyable, such as penguins and seals. Before you hear the rest of the recording, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. Although these three train journeys are undeniably breathtaking, some travellers prefer the longer journeys on offer in Australia. The Indian Pacific, for example, which travels from Sydney through to Perth and has been dubbed the adventure that spans Australia. With three nights on board, the train takes in the Blue Mountains and the Nullarbor Plains and, as the name implies, the Indian Pacific shows you two oceans. This train journey holds two world records. Covering 4,352 kilometres, it is one of the world's longest train journeys. It also travels the world's longest straight stretch of railway track, 478 kilometres. For those who find these distances a little daunting, passengers can stretch their legs at a number of different stops, such as Kalgoorlie, famous for gold, and Broken Hill, first founded as a silver mine. If three days on board a train seems a little excessive, there are alternatives. The Garn, for example, which travels from Adelaide in the south to Alice Springs in the centre of the continent, taking 20 hours. Passing through Crystal Brook, Port Augusta and Woomera, this journey gives an indication of what life was like for the earlier settlers as they discovered the country. Along the way, you can also see the Iron Man sculpture, which was constructed by railway workers to commemorate the one millionth concrete sleeper laid during the construction of the line. Finally, just a quick word about the Overland, which runs between Melbourne and Adelaide. As the first train to travel between the capitals of two states, it is a historic as well as relaxing way to travel, and is famous for being the oldest long-distance train journey on the continent. With so many memorable journeys to choose from, the only problem you will have is knowing which one to do first. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You'll hear two students discussing a survey they have to write as an assignment. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 26. How is your market research project going, George? Very well, actually, Anna. I've just got the results of the survey back, and so now I have to draw some conclusions from the information I've collected. That's good. I'm still writing my questionnaire. In fact, I'm starting to panic, as the project deadline is in two weeks, and I don't seem to be making any progress at all. What is your topic? Forms of transportation in the city. What about you? I've been finding out people's attitudes to the amount of violence on television. That's interesting. What do your results show? Well, as I said, I haven't finished writing my conclusions yet, but it seems most people think there is a problem. Unfortunately, there is no real agreement on the action that needs to be taken. Nearly everyone surveyed said that there was too much violence on TV. A lot of people complained that American police serials and Chinese kung fu films are particularly violent. The main objection seems to be that, although a lot of people get shot, stabbed, decapitated and so on, films never show the consequences of this violence. Although people die and get horribly injured, nobody seems to suffer or live with the injuries. Any children watching might take the heroes of these programs as role models and copy their behaviour. So what did most people suggest should be done? A lot of people were concerned about how these films affect children. They are particularly worried that children will try to behave like the stars. The survey shows that violent programs should be broadcast after 10pm, when most children are already in bed. There is also a significant minority of people who feel that violent films should be banned altogether. Well, how did people feel about the violence on news broadcasts? Most of the responses I have looked at have felt that violence on news broadcasts is more acceptable, as it's real. Although it's unpleasant, it is important to keep in touch with reality. Still many people thought that it would be better to restrict violent scenes to late viewing. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 27 to 30. Your survey sounds very good. How many people filled it in? I gave out 120 and I got 70 back. That's a very high rate of return. Who did you give your questionnaires to? I gave a copy to every student at my hall of residence and a few to friends from other colleges. Don't you think that this will influence your results? How do you mean? The people in your hall of residence are all about the same age. They're all students and from similar backgrounds. Therefore, it is likely that they will have similar opinions. Your results represent student opinion, not public opinion. So how are you going to do your research? Well, I'm going to interview my respondents in the shopping mall. What I'll do is ask people if they have five minutes to spare to answer a few questions. If they agree, I will ask them some multiple choice questions and tick off their answers on my sheet. Isn't it very difficult to ask meaningful questions using multiple choice? Yes, it is. The secret to writing a successful survey is to write simple multiple choice questions that target the information you're looking for. There. It's better to write a lot of short, specific questions than longer general ones. So that's why it is taking you so long to write? Yeah, but I hope I'll be ready to start interviewing at the weekend. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a tutor giving some business students instructions about a finance project. You now have thirty seconds to read questions thirty-one to thirty-six. Okay, can you quieten down, please? Now, today I'm going to talk to you about your assignment. We've been studying the effects of the exchange rate, so I'm going to give you a project to do on this. Right? Can you make some notes while I'm talking? The first thing that I'd like you to do in order to prepare this is to select where you're interested in. I mean, which country, and therefore which currency you're going to be operating in. Okay, now the purpose of the project is to make money, and I'm hoping some of you will make a significant amount. So I want you to suppose that you have one hundred pounds that you will have to invest purely in the rises and falls of the exchange system. In other words, you'll be trying to predict rates. This is a project that you'll be doing together. But before you work together, you'll have to go off and research what you need to know about the economy of that country and how well it's doing or is expected to do in the near future. You could all make up a little information sheet with your notes on, clearly legible. Because then I want you to get together. We can do that next week, and to go round and read about each other's countries. When you see how well or badly each country is doing, I want you to decide what your exchange rate is going to be against all the other currencies. After that is all sorted, what you're going to do is go round the other students. And attempt to sell your money to the others. Remember, this will depend on the success of your country's economy and the rate you fixed for your currency. Now, you're not allowed to just swap currencies with each other, but you may wish to buy from the other countries. But you must do a proper transaction. All the way through this, you must keep your accounts properly for each transaction. I'll give you one week to do this, and then we will set a time for the deals to finish, a bit like the stock exchange. And at that point, I will ask you to calculate how much you have made. Is that clear? You now have thirty seconds to read questions thirty-seven to forty. Okay. Now, before you begin that, there are a few things I want you to read up on to prepare. You need to look at the economies of the UK's main trading partners. I don't mean all of them, because that would be over eighty, but just the twenty-nine principal ones. There are summaries in the last three books on the book list I've given you. And so that you can practice applying the criteria on assessment I gave you, I'd then like you to focus just on one sector across all the countries. The most common one across every country is farming. But as much agricultural produce is for domestic consumption, I'd like you to look at manufacturing. 
Then I would like you to do a detailed investigation of one particular aspect. I was going to give you a choice, but I think as we've just started the course, it's better if we all look at the same thing and then we can discuss it in the seminars. So the thing I'd like you all to look at is fluctuations in import prices. Now, you need to do all that before you start the project, as it will help you assess the economies of the countries you'll be representing in the project. Don't worry, you've got plenty of time. Exam week is December the 8th, then it's the holidays until January the 6th, so I don't need the project in till February the 5th. Is that okay? Now, any questions on this? Because it's That is the end of part four.